the first class today, we began the study on uh, Second Timothy chapter one. We looked at verses one to verse eight. Uh, we'll continue study of um, uh, chapter one in Second Timothy. So, can somebody please read verses nine to verse twelve, please? First Timothy, Second Timothy chapter one, verses nine to twelve. Can somebody read verses 9 to 12, please? Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality, immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Amen. Yes, go ahead. Verse 12 also. For this reason I also suffered these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until the day. Amen. Thank you, Subhashis. So here, verse 9, now this is a very powerful and a, a loaded verse. Okay, so much here in just this one verse. It's saying, if you are saved, you are also called. Okay, and what kind of calling are you called into? What does he say? You're called into a holy calling. Yes. So if you're saved, you're called. You're called to this holy calling. So your, your calling is one of holiness or a, a, a call that is morally morally pure. Okay. Living a life that is morally pure uh, for him, in him, uh, and through Christ Jesus. So God has called us to his own purpose and grace according, uh, you know, uh, to his call, his purpose and his grace and not according to our works, our achievements or success. That is very, very important to keep in mind. So God has called us according to his own purpose and grace. He's not called us according to our works, achievements or success. Okay. So God has uh, uh, calls us to his purpose, which means he has given us the grace to walk uh, uh, in the call and the purpose that he has called us to. And like Paul is mentioning here, this is something that he has already planned even before time began. So if you look at this, he says, you know, um, not according to works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time uh, began. And we looked at this even uh, in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Okay, so it's talking about God's foreknowledge of things. He's called us to his own calling, purpose and grace even before time began. Verse 10, he says, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Okay. Um, so Paul knows that he's going to uh, die soon. But even in that situation, he's saying that he knows, you know, that Jesus is his Savior. Uh, and why is he saying that here? Because Jesus has, you know, uh, you know, as our Savior, Jesus, in exchange for the death that he has taken from us, he took our place, he took our death, and, you know, he has given us, you know, in exchange, he has given us his life. He has given us Zoe life, the eternal life, the God kind of life, and he has given us immortality. What is the meaning of immortality? Immortality means a life that is without corruption, you know, an unending existence. Um, 
So he's saying that he has given us and he's saying, you know, in, even though I'm going to die, even as death is impending on me, he's saying Jesus is my savior. And because he's my savior, you know, I know he has given me life and immortality through the gospel. Okay. So the reason why Jesus came, he, one of the reasons is he came because he is our savior. You know, uh, he came to reveal the purpose and the grace of God. And also he came to fulfill the eternal plan of God. And it is through Jesus that, you know, uh, uh, we are able to understand, uh, you know, God's ways, his plan. We are able to understand the mysteries of the revelation that was uh, uh, the revelation that was mysterious to us. We were able to understand God, know God in a deeper sense, and also to understand and know the plans of God. And one of that is, you know, sal the plan of salvation, the plan of redemption. Okay, so he's saying he has abolished, which means he is completely and definitely caused to cease. What has he caused to cease? What has he definitely abolished or completely removed away is death. Okay. And instead of that, he has given us life, eternal, Zoe life, the fullness of uh, life. And he's given us immortality through this gospel. Okay. So it's just so wonderful that Paul, even in the situation that he is, instead of uh, being down and dejected, he's looking at uh things in a more positive way and you know he's looking at things in the in the in the uh, uh, you know in the right sense you know he's looking at it from the place where he's seated at the right hand of god in a place of authority and he's looking at earthly things with a very eternal mindset with the eternal perspective okay We'll move on to verse 11, to which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. So Paul is basically stating his calling. He's saying that God has called him uh, to minister to the uh, Gentiles. And verse 12, he says, for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. Okay, so... Um, Paul is saying that even though he's in prison and he's going through suffering and hardship, you know, he's saying he's not ashamed of the gospel. You know, he's saying because of the gospel, it's not because he's done some crime or he's a criminal or he's done something that is wrong that he is put in prison. But he's saying, I am put in prison because I am a preacher of the gospel, but I am not ashamed of the gospel. That means he's saying, I'm not ashamed to be in chains or I'm not ashamed to be in prison uh, because of preaching the gospel. And he's also telling uh, Timothy that a Christian life uh, and the, the call of a, of a believer and the life of a believer is not exempt from suffering, hardships, uh, is not exempt from oppositions and persecutions, um, but that is very part and pass, parcel of our lives. Okay, but he's saying he is not ashamed of the gospel. Now, we see that Paul in verse 8 has already, you know, encouraged Timothy not to be ashamed. Uh, he says, therefore, do not be ashamed of for the testimony of the Lord or of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. So there he's telling Timothy what he needs, he does not need to be ashamed about. But now Paul is making his own statement on why he is not ashamed uh, to suffer for the sake of the gospel. He's not telling Timothy, hey, Timothy, I'm just telling you not, not to be ashamed, but I'm also telling myself, I'm making a statement on why I am not ashamed to suffer for the sake of the uh, gospel. Okay, So he's mentioning the fact that uh, he's saying that uh, you know, the fact is that, you know, he's empowered, Paul is empowered supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. And so he states two uh, additional reasons. You know, he says, I know whom I have believed. So he's saying, I know that I have believed in God. I know that I have believed in Jesus Christ, who is my Savior who is the source of grace, mercy, and truth, who is the one who has promised me eternal life and given immortality to me. 
Okay, so I think this is very very important for us. Uh, you know, even as we are uh, believers who are born again, it's very important to remind ourselves again and again not only of who we are in Christ, but also who is Christ to us. That truth should be uh, so engraved uh, in the heart, in our hearts and minds. It's important to know who we are believing in. You know, the God we believe in. Who is this God? What is his nature? What can he do? You know, uh, uh, how who he has been to us is something that we should never forget. It's something that should, uh, these truths should come alive when we go through uh, difficulties and uh, challenges uh, and situations. So Paul is saying that, you know, uh, I know, you know, who I believe. I believe in Jesus Christ. He's my savior. And he has promised life and immortality and is also the source of grace, mercy, and truth. And then the second additional reason he gives is saying, I know he's able to keep what I have committed to him. Or he's saying, I know, you know, uh, uh, that he's able to guard what I have deposited it with him. So he's saying, you know, uh, to protect, safeguard, and to keep what I've committed to uh, Christ until that day, which means, you know, Paul is saying, I have placed my life in his hands, and I know whose hands I've placed my life. I've placed my hands in the, in the hands of the one who's able to keep it, okay? So the second part of this verse, uh, uh, the second part of this verse 12, you know, can be rendered both ways and can be true in both ways. We can say he's able to guard what has been committed by me to him. And also God is able to guard what has been committed to me by him. Okay, I repeat that. God is able to guard what has been committed by me to him and he's able to guard what has been committed to me by him. So both ways, you know, God is able to do and to be faithful. And he and it's uh, we can understand this uh, the the latter part of verse twelve in both these ways. Okay. So uh, you know, even as uh, you live your life, you know, uh, remember that uh, you know whose hands you are in. You are in the hands of the one who's able to guard. Uh, and who's able to keep what you've uh, committed uh, by me, by you, to him, and what has been committed to you by him. Okay? And he's, he's a God who is uh, faithful and he will do it for us. Okay? Before we uh, move on to verse 13, anyone has any questions, any doubts? Any questions, any doubts? Okay, if not, we'll move on to verses 13. So can please somebody read verses 13 to verse 18, please? Anyone like to read verses 13 to verse 18 of 2 Timothy chapter 1? Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This is this, you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Tychelus and Hermotinus. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesi for us, for he often repressed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very jealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. Amen. Thank you, Subhashis. So here Paul is continuing to reiterate what he's already told Timothy in First Timothy, you know, to 
and also reminding him why he's put him there in Ephesus uh, is to protect the church from all kinds of false teachings. We'll not uh, go into it because you've already looked at it in quite in detail. So Paul is once again reminding Timothy to stay with the teachings, to stay with the truth in God's word, uh, to teach the word and the doctrine in God's word, uh, which Timothy has learned, which has been given to him, has been entrusted to uh, him. And he says, walk in faith and love in Christ Jesus. Okay. Um, so Timothy is, Paul is saying, Timothy, you know, Timothy's, uh, you know, walk in faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Okay. So basically, Timothy's faithfulness has to be, you know, tempered with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. And, um, you know, um, some people, you know, when they preach and teach God's word, they do it in a, in a very intellectual way manner and uh, they leave out faith and love okay uh, uh, which means that they are so uh, you know intellectual uh, so theological and they can come down as condescending on the people condemning the people uh, uh, and there's no faith and love in what they are teaching they can become so uh, uh, just holding on to traditionals and rituals and it can become so bounding on uh, uh, you know uh, on people and uh, because then when they miss out on the aspects of faith and love so he's saying that you know uh, when you preach and teach do it with faith and love okay so faith and love describe how the truth is to be held god's word is truth and god's truth has to be held in faith and love okay so ho we hold it in faith when we believe okay and uh, uh, not only just believe but we put our lives into it that means the way we live we live you know based on what we believe what we uphold as the truth okay and we also hold it in love uh, not in proud arrogance you know that hey i'm able to keep it not you are not able to keep it like that's why jesus condemned the pharisees because you know um, they were trying to judge people on outward basis you know and they were being very proud and arrogant you know and uh, they were doing it all out of uh, you know seeking superiority for themselves self-seeking superiority so paul is reminding timothy that hey when you preach when you teach do it out of faith and love that means when you preach and teach you know, do it in such a way that you, you are holding on to those truths in faith and living it out by faith and do it in love not in proud arrogance that you are able to keep it others are not or others are below you or others are not super spiritual like you are and don't do it for self-seeking superiority okay um so that is very, very important, even as, uh, you know, we preach and teach. So if one thinks they are faithful to the truth, uh, but they do not show faith and love in their lives, then, you know, they we are nothing like the Pharisees in Jesus' time, you know, uh, where they were committed to holding on to the teachings uh, of the law, but they had no fruit of faith and love that were evident in their lives. And that's why Jesus called them as whitewashed tombs, right? Because they looked so good on the outside, the way they dressed, the way they acted, the way they prayed, the way they did all those rituals, everything. You know, they looked super spiritual. They were seeking, uh, you know, uh, uh, people to look upon them as someone who was, hey, here is a man you know, who's super spiritual, but inside they were just hollow, empty, dead in their spirit, man, okay? The f uh, faith and love was not evident in their uh, lives, okay? Verse 14, uh, Paul goes on to say, that good thing which is committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. So, again, Paul is reminding Timothy like he reminded him in First Timothy, chapter 6 verse 20 where he says guard what was committed to your trust with the help of the holy spirit and so he is again reminding him here that uh, you know the holy spirit is the one who guides us into all truth and because the holy spirit guides us into all truth we also need the power of the holy spirit 
to guard the word within. Okay. Uh, we need the Holy Spirit's guidance. We need the Holy Spirit's anointing, uh, uh, you know, to guard the word of God that is deposited in us. You know, sometimes we think we just need the anointing uh, to preach, anointing to teach, unite, anointing to, uh, to do mighty signs and miracles. Yes, it's important. But also we need to... The power of the Holy Spirit, or we need the anointing. Anointing means power in the presence of the Holy Spirit. We need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to guard the word within us, to guard the truth within us. So you can pray this for yourself. You say, God, let your anointing guard the truth and the word that is within uh, me. You know, uh, so that, you know, um, anytime, every time the I need it. The word will just come forth, come alive, will speak to me. Uh, you know, uh, let not the evil one snatch it away. You know, uh, just guard the word that is within me. So, like we read in First John chapter two, verse twenty and twenty-seven, it says, "The anointing within, you know, will teach us what is right and wrong." Okay. We'll move on, verses 15. This you know that also those in Asia have turned away from me. Among them are Phygelius and Hermogenes. Okay, so it is. Uh, it appears that some believers from Asia Minor have uh, deserted or abandoned their association, their friendship with Paul because of his imprisonment. Maybe they're scared that they too will be imprisoned. And Paul is mentioning two names here. Um, you know, who uh, uh, abandoned their friendship, their association with Paul, uh, and we don't know anything much about these two uh, people, okay? Uh, and it's no wonder, you know, Paul is, that's why encouraging Timothy not to be ashamed of speaking for the Lord and not to be ashamed of being associated with um, genuine ministers like him who are in prison, who are in uh, chains, as we read earlier in this chapter, okay? Verse 16 to verse 18, um, here in verse 16, he's talking about Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus is not mentioned elsewhere, but, you know, uh, what a wonderful of, of aff affirmation of this uh, man for what he did for Paul. Paul is saying that, you know, Onesiphorus was one who ministered to Paul at Ephesus. He came to Rome. When he came to Rome, he was looking for Paul. He searched uh, him out in Rome and he's often ref refreshed Paul and he's saying that now when he is in chains Paul is saying you know uh, Onesiphorus is not ashamed of associating with uh, him even though Paul is in prison even though Paul is in uh, chains okay so Onesiphorus even though we don't know anything much about him is a good example of something that we too can follow something that we can also do for people in the body of Christ or for those who are persecuted for the sake of the gospel. Okay. Okay, so that was uh, first uh, second Timothy chapter one for us. Anyone has any questions, any doubts? Anything that you need more clarity on? When it says in verse 18, uh, the Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. So which day it talks about? Lord grant to him that he may find mercy in that day. It's basically taking, talking about, the, you know, Paul is referring to the judgment day, you know, when our deeds will be, we will be rewarded for our deeds. Anyone else? Any questions? Any doubts? Okay, if there are no questions, any doubts, uh, we'll move on to 
uh, chapter 2. So can somebody read uh, chapter 2 uh, verses 1 to uh, verse uh, 7, please? Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And in the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit this to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ, of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the fruits. Consider what I say. And may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. So in uh, chapter 2, he's saying, you know, you therefore, my son, is referring to Timothy as son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Okay. Or he's saying, be empowered by the grace that is in Christ uh, Jesus. Okay. Who is the source of grace? God, yes, God is a, a source of grace. God has bestowed his grace on you and me. Uh, if you look at Ephesians chapter 2, you know, uh, Paul writes there, says, God has lavished us with his grace. He talks about the abundance of his grace. You know, when Paul is saying, uh, be strong in the grace that is given to us in Christ, he's saying, you know, be established in the grace of Jesus Christ that has been given to us, okay? Now, what does Paul mean here? Uh, it means that, you know, don't let anyone or anything shake you from the fact that God is a God of grace and his grace has been extended to you, has been lavished upon you and his abundance of the riches of his grace has been extended to you okay so it's very important and paul is reminding him here because maybe paul is also in a situation you know where he keeps reminding himself of the 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 grace of god that is going is extended to him even as he's in prison even as he's going to face death you know and he's reminding timothy of the grace of god that is is in abundance you know has been extended to him uh the riches of uh, the, the grace that is in Christ Jesus has been extended to him, even as he is in this place of huge and big responsibility. And it's also important for us to remind ourselves about the abundance riches of his grace that has been extended to us. Why is it important? Because the devil is very good, you know, to get us out of grace. Uh, one of the areas that the devil wants to move us is out of grace and, uh, you know, uh, give more importance to works. Okay. So that is why Paul keeps writing over and over again. Romans, he's talking about the grace uh, against the law. He talks about uh, grace against the law. Again, in, in the book of Galatians, he explains that so elaborately. Uh, and so in all of his episodes, he's basically talking about uh, grace against law because, you know, the, one of the areas that the devil, you know, wants us to move out is grace because we know that salvation is by grace through faith, okay? It's not by works. And um, he's kind of instilling this in the minds of the of the, his fellow Jews or Judaizers who have become Christians because they're still holding on to the vain rituals and customs and, you know, circumcision and, uh, you know, feasts and all of these occasions. So much giving, again, importance to the uh, works, okay? And, uh, you know, so important for us also. Sometimes we think that, you know, we need to do things to earn 
at the blessings of God, the grace of God, the favor of God, you know. Um, and so, you know, sometimes we think, hey, uh, if I read my Bible today and pray, then, you know, or I, uh, then I'm going to, the day is going to go well, you know. Or my day did not go well because I didn't have time to pray and read my Bible. Or uh, everything went, uh, you know, uh, bad today because I didn't spend time with God. Or, you know, we think that, uh, you know, if we give money towards charity, you know, God will be happy with us. He will bless us. We won't have any problems. We won't have any difficulties. Uh, you know, yes, we do works. It's, all of these are important. We have to read our Bible. We have to pray. You know, we give uh, uh, and bless uh, God's kingdom. We give towards people who do not have. You know, Paul talks about that. We in First Timothy, he's he he talks about it. You know, um, uh, talks about riches. How people who are rich should use their riches to extend and build God's kingdom. Uh, so yes, we do works. But we do works not to earn, but we do works, you know, uh, uh, because we have received the abundance of the grace of God. Okay, that's very important to keep in mind. We do works not to earn the blessings of God, the favor of God, the grace of God, but we do works because we have already received the abundant riches of His grace. And we do works out of a joyful heart and a heart that has already been blessed by him. So we're saying, God, I've been blessed by you, so I want to bless others. And that is why he's telling, you know, in First Timothy, he's telling Timothy and he's telling the church, those of you who are rich, now use your riches to bless others for the kingdom of um, uh, God. Okay. So, um, you know, um, so we do things out of a joyful heart, a heart that has been blessed by him, you know. Uh, so when we do it, we say, God, you know, I'll give you everything uh, because you have given me everything that I need. And I'm doing all of these works because I am so deeply grateful, you know, for what you have blessed me with, okay. Another area that the devil can get us out of grace is in the area of guilt and condemnation okay uh, uh, you know god's grace has lavished us with divine favor uh, because god sees us as his beloved uh, but the devil is the accuser of the brethren and you know he accuses us and he draws us out of that place of grace okay so it's very important for us to always keep ourselves in that position to know the grace of God that is over our uh, lives. And that is why he's telling Timothy, Timothy, be strong in the grace. Okay. And it's a reminder for us also for us to be strong in the grace. Now, when we look at this verse, word grace in the New Testament, what are the three things that it, uh, it signifies? Grace in the New Testament. Remember, I taught you this in the first year when you studied uh, receiving God's guidance for your life. Anyone remembers? What does grace mean in the New Testament? In the New Testament, what does grace mean? Hello, class. Anyone would like to try? Unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. Okay, thank you. Remember three things that we looked at in... Um, First year, okay, grace in the New Testament means, um, you know, uh, divine empowerment, divine favor, and divine character. Remember those three things? Divine character, divine favor, divine empowerment, okay, or divine empowering. So grace is always empowering us, okay. Um, in the New Testament, grace also means empowering. 
So when we looked at First Timothy uh, chapter one verse nine, you know, uh, Paul tells Timothy, uh, who, "God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which He has given us in Christ Jesus before time began." Okay, so. Grace not only empowers us, but grace also means divine favor. So the grace of God empowers us, it makes us strong and also gives us power, uh, favor. Sorry. We can and so we can draw strength from his grace. Yes, the devil may make us feel inadequate. Uh, to the point that we don't do anything. Uh, sometimes we can feel inadequate. Sometimes we feel the task is too great, too big, like Timothy is feeling. Uh, but, you know, at those times, we need to rely on the grace of God. Because when God calls us, because, you know, we we read in, in, the, in the previous verse, Paul is reminding Timothy that God has given us a call and a purpose. When he gives us a call and a purpose, his grace is more than sufficient for us to fulfill that call and that purpose. Okay, that is very important to keep in mind. So, you know, and he's reminding uh, Timothy here, and also it's a powerful reminder for us. You know, when God calls you to a specific ministry office, you know, and you feel like quitting, you feel like giving up, you know, uh, don't because, you know, know that his grace will, is more than sufficient. His grace will empower you, you know, and it's his grace, with this, it is with his grace that you can go forward, you know, and it is his grace which will undergird us. It's his grace which will undertake for all of our limitations and inadequacies okay uh, so it's important to keep this in mind so some of you feel like quitting feel like giving up any point in time you know remember that god has put you in that place it is his calling it is his purpose that you are there and if you're 100 percent sure that it is his calling his purpose also know uh, you know, f and also be a, a rest assured that His grace is more than sufficient. His grace will undergird you. His grace will undertake for all of your uh, limitations and your inadequacies. Okay. So when you stand firm in the grace of God, uh, you know, then you will not shy away from the challenges. You will not, uh, uh, you know, be undeterred or overwhelmed with the. Uh, uh, the challenge that is there before you, you will not be, um, uh, you know, uh, feeling overwhelmed with the greatness of the task, because you, know, you will and and you will go ahead with uh, confidence. You will go ahead with strength, with um, uh, uh, confidence, knowing that the grace of God will enable you. Okay, isn't that uh, beautiful the way Paul, you know, uh, is just uh, uh, building up Timothy, is just empowering, is just encouraging him uh, to stay true to his call. And I think, you know, Paul is writing all these things because in the situation that he is in, he's reminded himself of all of these uh, things. Okay. Verse 2, he says, and the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Okay, so Paul is charging Timothy, he's saying, you know, uh, 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 pass on to the succeeding generations these truths that needs to be taught because uh, Paul knows that, you know, that is what he has done. You know, he has passed on these truths to Timothy, Titus, to... Uh, uh, Aquila, Priscilla, to uh, to uh, Onesimus, um, uh, to you know Philemon, and to uh, Tychicus, and to all so, so many other people. You know, he's passed on all of these truths, and they are now preaching and teaching. And Paul knows that he's no longer having uh, the freedom to preach and teach, and so he's um, he's saying, telling Timothy, "Hey, Timothy." Time is short, you know, you might not be too long in Ephesus, you know, you don't know how long, but you know, what is important is you pass on to the succeeding uh, generations, the truth that has to be taught. 
thought. And this is something that all of us must do. You know, we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing with God, what God has put in our lives? You know, what are we doing with what uh, we have experienced with God and about God? You know, and what are we doing with what we have received from God? So we know that Paul, uh, you know, encountered God, he experienced God. We know that he received those revelations during his silent years, you know, and what is he what has he done with all of those things? He has continuously taught and preached and taught, uh, written about it and edifying people, edifying the churches. So, you know, we need to ask that same question. What are we doing with what God put, has put in our lives? What are we doing with what we have experienced with God, with what we have received from God? You know, what are we doing about it? Are we passing it on to someone else? You know, are you teaching? Are you preaching? And it's important for us to do that. Okay. Uh, before we end class today, we look at, uh, you know, three analogies that Paul presents in chapter 2, verses um, uh, 3 to verse 6. He talks about three analogies here. And what are the three analogies that he's using here? Can anyone tell me what are the three analogies? It's there in verses 3 to verse 6. It's in your Bible, so it's easy. What are the analogies Paul is using? Hello, anyone in the class, please? What are the analogies he's talking about in verses 3 to 6? I'm waiting for some answers. Analogies means what are the comparisons, parallels that he's making. If you don't want to unmute your mics and speak, you can post it on the chat section. Are all of you in class or just logged in and you're not present can i have some answers please yes we are here listening <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thank <laughs> you Salatoli. yes jeffina says a soldier okay what else so there's one comparison of a soldier and what else does he talk about athletics okay an athlete yes Thank you, Jeffina. Thank you, Zelotoli, and a farmer. Yeah. Yes, go ahead, Lyndon. I said a uh, wrestler, according to verse 5, I think. Wrestling. Okay. okay, thank you. So here he uses three analogies, one of a soldier, one of an athlete, and one of a farmer. Okay, so he's basically trying to tell Timothy what are the characteristics to be a good minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, so first thing he says is uh, like a soldier. So what, as a soldier, what should Timothy do? We know he's a minister of God, but as a minister of God, what is uh, the analogy of a soldier that he can use? Endure hardship. Yes, the life of a soldier is not easy. You know, um, it's not a life of comfort, ease, and, uh, you know, pleasure. But uh, a soldier must be ready to go through hardships, to train, you know. So he's saying, hey, Timothy, you know, you are a man of God, and it's not going to be easy. Uh, as a man of God, you are like a soldier uh, who wants to serve God. And, you know, uh, and hence you should you should not look for a life of ease or comfort, but be ready to go uh, through hardships. And he's saying that, you know, a soldier is always ready for the call of duty, right? Uh, yes, he takes care of his family, but he's not so caught up in that, that he's not ready to respond to the call of duty. So 
you know, no man who is a soldier gets entangled with civilian affairs. He does not get entangled with the affairs of this life. You know, uh, he's always ready for the call of duty, always ready to respond to the call of duty. So he's telling Timothy, Timothy, live like that. You know, always be ready to, to do the calling and the purpose that God has on your uh, life. Don't get entangled with the affairs of this life. Okay, so so important for us as ministers of God not to en get entangled with the things that distract us, the things that, uh, you know, removes our focus away from what God has called us, what God has purposed for us to do, you know, uh, set them all aside and just focus on your calling and your uh, responsibilities. It does not mean that, you know, because we are to fulfill the call and the purpose of God in our lives, it does not mean that we don't fulfill the responsibilities towards our family, our spouses, our children, our parents. Uh, it's not saying that, yes, we do it, but we must, you know, they supersede, uh, you know, the, uh, the call and the purpose of God. That means we need to be ready to do what God has called us to do. So don't get entangled with the wrong things. Keep yourself free for what God has called you to. Then he talks about the second analogy is that of an athlete, okay? Now, for an athlete to win, what should he do? For an athlete to win a race, what should he do? You should run with endurance and uh, with a lot of enthusiasm and always fixing your eyes to the finishing line. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Lubega. Yes, you need to run with endurance. You need to run with perseverance. You fix your eyes on the finish line. Yes. What else an athlete should do? What should an athlete do to run a race? Yes, abide by the rules. Yes. Before the athlete... Sorry, Rosalind, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, even even if he falls while running, he should get up and complete the race. Okay, perseverance, endurance, never giving up. Just train himself up. It's important to train, right? You need to train yourself up. Prepare well, okay? Uh, without preparing well, you cannot run a race. And also abide by the rules. You have to compete by the rules. So, you know, when you run the race, you run only not when you feel like running. You run only when the whistle blows or the gun shot, okay? And you have to run your race keeping to your lane, okay? You can't, uh, you know, move from one lane to the other. You'll be disqualified. And also, you need to run not wherever you want to, but you need to run to the finish line, right? Only then can you win the race. So, he's saying... You know, as like an athlete, prepare well, Timothy, you know, and compete by the rules and also, you know, uh, run in such a way with perseverance, endurance uh, to finish the race. Okay. So also when we serve the Lord, we need to serve the Lord, not in our own terms and conditions, uh, you know, but we need to do it according to his standard. Okay, we need to live according to his standard, his call, what he desires of us, uh, meet his requirements and keep his standards. That's very important. Sometimes we think, you know, uh, hey, you know, uh, I'm serving the Lord, but we're doing what we feel comfortable. We, we do what we want to, we feel uh, uh, is right or what we love or what uh, pleases us. And as far as we're getting money, as far as we're getting fame and position, you know, that is, that is good. No, but that is not, uh, you know, serving God according to his requirements, his standards. And that is why, you know, Jesus says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we did this, we did that, you know, but Jesus says, I do not know who you are. Why? Because they did everything that they thought God wanted them to do, but they did not do it according to his standard, his requirements, or did not do his calling and his purpose. They did what they felt was their calling and their 
uh, purpose. Okay, so he's saying it's important that you compete by the rules, live by God's standard for his, for your for the call that he has over your life. And the last thing he's saying, you know, the analogy of a farmer. He's saying, like a farmer, you need to be what? Hard working. Thank you, Jeffina. Only when you're hard working, you enjoy the fruit. Without hard work, there can be no harvest. There can be no joy. So sometimes when you're in ministry, you will think, hey, you know, in ministry, you're working so much more harder than even people work in the corporate or in the world. Uh, well, yes, it is, you know. Um, it is hard work, and without hard work, we cannot enjoy the fruits. And Jesus himself has showed us through the parables of the, of the good steward, parable of the talents, that yes, it is hard work. So only if you work hard, you can enjoy uh, the fruit, you can enjoy a rich and a good harvest. So these are the three analogies that he uses of a soldier, of an athlete, and of a farmer. Okay, we'll stop here. Any questions anyone has? has anyone has any questions okay if uh, there are no questions you know uh, we need to have uh, a first assessment on first timothy so when can we have that can you suggest a date please sometime next week is next week seventh or eighth uh, thursday or friday good can we have some responses? Is seventh good or eighth good? Thursday good or Friday good for me to post the assessment? Friday? Seventh. Jeffina says seventh. Thursday is seventh. Everyone is okay with seventh? Okay. Thank you, Zelatoli. What about the others? Okay, I'll post it on 7th, Thursday, uh, next Thursday. Uh, your first submission date will be uh, 11th. That's Monday. Is that fine? Okay, thank you everyone for uh, joining class. Have a blessed weekend. A refreshing and a blessed weekend. I'll see you all uh, for class on Tuesday. Thank you.